Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and start. During the, the little lunch break, I was asked the question, um, what do you do when, you know, how can you talk to someone who has, had, uh, has the background of theistic evolution and says that the Bible, that the creation account in Genesis 1 through 11 is actually allegory and not historical fact, and it needs to be looked at because it's like poetry and stuff, how can you tell if this is supposed to be um, historical narrative? Well, that's what this lesson and the next one. As I said last night, these are the key ones. This is where I need you to really turn on your thinking caps and really try and stay with me on this one, particularly on the second part t this afternoon. But that's exactly what we're going to get into because this does have a lot to do with doctrine. It's just not the, the first 11 chapters of Genesis and whether it's allegory or not. It has to do with the entire reason Christ came. And it means, uh, it has a tremendous amount to do with the entire biblical narrative. So it's just not 11 chapters set at the beginning of the Bible that we can sort of buy, pass off as a story time and then take the rest of the Bible more seriously. It's not like that. And that's what I want to show you. Bible and doctrine. This is a two-part lesson um, that we're going to be doing, taking a break again in the middle on what I call the Genesis days. I've uh, presented this a number of times at places and in front of um, Bible students and stuff. I get asked to do this. Matter of fact, I just got asked to do this just recently again. Um, this is an important one because it gets into doctrine. So in this Bible, or in this session here, we're going to open up our Bibles. We're going to look in deeply in our Bibles and start examining different passages and stuff as we get into this. So with that, because of the importance of this one, I just want to open in prayer on this one and uh, really ask God to just open up our, our minds and help us to learn. Father God, we come before you, and as you tell us in the book of Corinthians, it is your spirit that does the teaching. Lord, we just ask now that your spirit uh, does the teaching. You um, can show us through your word and through different methods here that these stories are not just myths. They're not little bedtime stories, but these are all historical things that took place, and it explains the entire book uh, books of the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, all this is is t um, bound and um, twisted all together and blended together. And help me, Lord, to make this clear and for everybody's minds to be able to accept this, that you would teach this well in Jesus' name. Amen. So, does it really matter if one takes the Genesis account as literal, historic? or as poetic and allegory? Does it really make that much of a difference? Well, according to most pastors and most teachers that go on in churches today, no, it doesn't make that big of a difference. They say, you can believe whatever you want. Well, that's true. And as Peter talks about in his letters, uh, his epistles, that there are things called baby Christians. There are immature Christians. And I think this is something that determines somewhat, not always, but this is something that I think more baby Christians would accept. Because mature Christians that understand and get into the meat of the gospel, and Peter goes on to talking about having meat or milk as what you're eating, you get more into the meat, you start to see this does make a major difference. And for one, just teaching this as a poetic or allegory, just as a cute bedtime story, you run into a very obvious problem. Well, what do you do with the rest of the Bible stories then? Why is it just Genesis 1 through 11? As I pointed out last night, the creation account is repeated numerous times in Scripture, but they never talk about that. They just focus on Genesis. So does it really matter? Well, first of all, where did, let's go back to the beginning here. Where did the idea of a day being millions of years long come from? Because I'll tell you, it was not something that was started by the Hebrew people. It did not originate with the Hebrews. It came much later. So most of the early church fathers, and we're talking at the time after Christ now, the apostolic age and stuff, afterwards, after the apostles have died, the early church fathers, almost all of them from their writings, we have copies of antiquity, uh, from antiquity of their, their writings and stuff, and almost all of them believed in a 24-hour literal creation story. It was just accepted all through the church. 
And that was most of them. That's what they believed. The apostles were on this, and um, their disciples after that sort of got into this. But later in the early church, it started to change. Why? The apostles are gone. You've lost those type of instrumental teachers. And we started using, and what happened just in education alone, Greek philosophy, which was part of the Roman Empire at this point also, started taking over even into the church. And Greek philosophy and Greek way of teaching and stuff fell into this. And some of them, some writers then, early in the church history, start writing that they were not literal 24-hour days. Um, But this idea didn't um, result from biblical study. It came from, are you ready? Greek mythologies were added into this. Yes, that's not a good thing, but that's what happened in the early church. After the apostles and stuff, Greek stories and stuff started infiltrating, and their style of teaching and learning moved into the early church type of of teaching. And that started the change. You can actually trace it back in Christianity to this period of time. Now, today the idea has become extremely popular. As a matter of fact, most Christian universities in the United States and around the world, this is what they teach that it's Darwinian evolution. They call it theistic evolution because they don't want to use that name. So they call it, um, I mean, let's just call it what it is. It is Darwinian evolution. That God used Darwinian evolution and other type of influences, and that's what the creation account actually means. So that's what we use. Churches preach this. Not all, thank God. Uh, Some churches are staying true to the word, but many pastors today are just accepting this or they're saying it really doesn't matter. Which one you believe? As long as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, nothing else really matters. Whoa, that is a very dangerous statement to make. Because why Jesus came, why did he sacrifice, why did he have to die is all tied in to Genesis 1 through 11. If you're going to build a house, you don't build the roof first. You don't put the walls up first. First thing you do is you build the foundation. The Old Testament is the foundation. Why everything is standing is based upon the foundation. As you all know, you remove the foundation. If a storm comes by, house built too close to the sea, storm comes by, wipes out the, fa- the foundation, the whole church or the whole building falls. The building, the house is going to fall. Foundations are very important. This is the foundation of Christianity. Yes, it's in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. This is the foundation. So how do we get into this? Well, There was a guy by the name of Charles Lyell, and Charles Lyell uh, lived in the uh, early 1800s, and he wrote a book all on the age of the earth. It was basically based on the physical features, a geology book, but he wrote that the features that you see on the earth today were not caused by a supreme God. He was not a believer. God didn't make the world. God God did not create the world. He was following Hutton's ideas, who came before him, that Everything happens by erosion and other methods. So if you go out, like, I embarrass my wife here for a little bit. This is a sad thing. But um, <laughs> you should see the face I'm getting right now. She has no idea what I'm about to say. When we went out west, I was telling you we went um, a while back. We went to Wyoming and stuff, if you were here earlier. Um, as we were driving through the Black Hills, she is looking out the window, and she made a comment. She says, oh, my gosh, that is just so awesome looking at the colors and stuff of the Black Hills and how it's all put together. And she says, this is just beautiful, how awesome and great God is that he created that to look like that. And I'm driving the car, and I said, well, hon, actually, that's a result of sin. What? And I said, remember, there was a worldwide flood. That is piles of mud and sediment resulting from the flood, which came across because sinful man, that wasn't there when God created the world. I remember her turning and looking at me and, thanks for ruining my inspirational moment. <laughs> I don't know if she remembers it. I remember that. <laughs> but that's what, that's what Lyle is saying. That's what Hutton says. Matter of fact, uh, Darwin took this. When Darwin, when he was still very young and went on his voyage on the H. M.S. Beagle around the world to, uh, and actually during this time, formulated his theory more, he was handed a copy of Charles Lyell's book, talking about that the earth is not just, you know, under 10,000 years old, that the earth is millions and millions of years old. And as we said, for Darwinian evolution, time is of the essence. It's a major pillar. So this book influenced, tremendously influenced Darwin because Darwin, who started off, by the way, if you don't know, Darwin was not a biologist. Darwin started off to be a physician. 
after observing his first operation of a child, which without anesthesia, it freaked him out, and he switched to, are you ready? Theology. He was going to be a pastor. That's what his background is. Now, he was fascinated with what they call naturalism. Today, we call it like biology. He was fascinated with that. But that's what his actual background is, though he dabbled as a, a biologist. And on the HMS Beagle, he signed on as the naturalist because they're exploring all around the world. He's sailing everywhere. They would take naturalists along. They would take plankton studies, study the animal life and stuff because they're, they're studying new areas. And so he signed on for this. But for this long journey, there's no internet. There's no... Uh, uh, CD players. There's no DVDs. What are you going to do? So Lyle makes an offering of his book for Darwin. Here, read this. we will give you something to read. Darwin was already contemplating this idea of, his, of the evolutionary theory. Well, this, in reading the book, as he wrote um, later on, and he wrote much on this about how that book influenced his thinking because it gave him time for the changes to take place. Without it, that pillar's gone, the whole theory falls apart. So he needed it, and that's what Lyle's book did for him. And as we've already mentioned, James Hutton, just to bring you up to date on this, the universe, um, Lyle was basically saying the universe is only like millions of years old, but Hutton said, no, the universe is billions of years old. Um, and this idea and stuff, and that came all along with Darwin, and it was from Hutton's theory, where he presented that, as we've said, the past, it, you can figure out what happened in the past by what goes on in the present. And so that was Hutton's whole thing. So all of this is related, and Darwin is taking this information, the works of Hutton, the works of Lyell, and he needed, uh, he knew that, uh, or was thinking that there's changes that take place, but I need a lot of time. 10,000 years isn't enough time. Well, this gives him the time for this theory. That's how this all got put together. But that caused a problem now with what the church was teaching, because most of the church at this time was teaching a literal 24-hour day creation. But now, um, in the uh, mid-1800s, we have Darwin's book being published, and it starts to change everything. And people are saying, well, this is science, and science has got to override God. Uh, and our Bible, our Bible can't be that accurate. It's got a bunch of these weird stories. Those must be myths, so let's go with the biology. Let's go with the science and stuff. And they started to do that. And so some Christians started slowly picking up on this and started accepting it until we've come to the point today that the majority of Christian universities, the majority of even evangelical churches now teach that the earth is billions of years old and God used evolution to do it. That's how we got here. We've lost faith in the word of God. What's happened is we have taken science and placed science as an idol above God. Science can't make an error. I mean, what says in the Bible, God doesn't make errors. That's one of his characters. Science can't make errors. Well, I just cited you already today. They found errors just this week. They're changing their theories. And as I mentioned before, nothing changes. No deity in history changes or morphs as quickly and as often as science. So if you're picking science to be your God, you've got the worst God there is because it is constantly having to change because new discoveries keep coming up, whereas the Bible is true, and it has evidence, archaeological evidence, and other type of evidence that I can present, which is what evidence for faith does. We use science, the Bible, history, and logic to show that the Bible is really true. That's the whole basis of evidence for faith, those four pillars. But that's how we got to this point and what's going on in this world today. So because of the natural cycles, like looking at the Grand Canyon and stuff, we look at this, and if you go there, you'll see plaques saying that this is millions of years old. You go down to Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. I took my youth group um, one year from when I was teaching in Illinois, took them down to Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. We went down there, and the whole premise was I was telling all the parents in the church, um, as we go down, we're going to eat in the snowball dining room, if you've ever been there, like 260 feet underground. And the premise was this is as close as we hope our kids ever get to hell. And <laughs> little joke. But anyway, we went there. And of course, they're talking about how on the tours that this thing took millions of years. Actually, it could be explained very easily by, by flooding and stuff that it causes catastrophes. The Bible teaches catastrophism. Catastrophes are what change things. It doesn't take God millions of years, but they reason it must because we see it this way. And science has been saying it. Lyell, Hutton, and others, and Darwin say that this, the pres how you figure out and read the present, you got to look at the past. No, you're putting God inside of a box. You're going to tell me that God could not make the Grand Canyon in just a, a short period of time? 
Why are you limiting the power of God? But that's what they don't realize. They seldom, Christians I'm talking about here, seldom realize they're putting God inside of a box saying, God, you can't do it that way because the laws of science dictate this. God is beyond the laws of science. Just examine what Jesus did. Was he not constantly going contrary to the laws of science? It's funny because, oh, yeah, we don't deny that Jesus, God does miracles. But to create the Grand Canyon in, in a six 24-hour day period or something like that, no, it can't be done. Actually, it wasn't. That was a result of Noah's flood. It came later. But that God can't do that? He can't have the star's light come here that fast? Oh, it's beyond, uh, that goes beyond the laws of science, thus God can't do it. Many times Christians just don't realize that fact, that by buying into this theory, we're limiting the power of God, which I think makes people more baby Christians. Christians who accept this premise reason that the Bible states that a day can be like a million years to God. I've heard this so many times. Well, Michael, um, a million years, if you're, you live for eternity, a million years is like one day to God. As a matter of fact, they'll even point out Bible verses and stuff like that to support that idea. Um, here's one that they, they use quite often, Psalm 90, verse 4. It says, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. See, a thousand years is just like a day. So to a day to God, it's a thousand years. Or look at this one in 2 Peter chapter 3, 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I get this all the time. This is what people often quote to me, those two verses. And they'll say, see, it says right in the Bible, to God, who's telling us all this stuff, a, a day is just a thousand years. We've got a problem here that they don't realize. If that's what a thousand days is, if that's what God is saying, uh, how long a, a day actually is, that it's actually thousands of years, Christ is still in the tomb. Wouldn't he be? How long was Jonah in the fish? Man, Jonah didn't come out to what? Uh, maybe he's still in there. Let's see. That would have been about 700 BC. He's still in the fish. See, they don't understand the, the ramifications of their lack of study. That this is not what this is talking about. This is not God. And both these passages are taking out of context. They're not talking where God is defining what a day is. He did that back in Genesis. And if, yes, in eternity, this is a figure of speech. Many Christians today claim that God just couldn't have created it in 24 days. I have actually had Christians tell me this. To my face, God could not have done the whole creation of the universe in 24, six 24-hour days. It's impossible. And then when they say, I'm, I'm like, are you, under, are you listening to what you're saying? You're saying things, there are certain things God can't do that are impossible for God? They don't understand the ramification. They don't think it through in most cases. And some state that the 24-hour theory of the Bible is a literal error. Thus... We have to take it as an allegory, as a poetic story, as a fairy tale. That's the way we have to accept it. And that's what is taught by many churches today. And many Christians fall into this. I was telling one person earlier today, Christian University, Wheaton College, probably most of you have known it. Wheaton College down in um, outside of Chicago on the west side. Very famous Christian University. Do you know that Noah, Nova on PBS a couple of, about a decade or so ago, actually did a special on Wheaton College. What was it about? Why would a science program like NOAA, NOVA that supports Darwinian evolution and that and, and there is no God, atheism, why would they do a study on a, a show having to do with Wheaton? Because Wheaton had thrown the creation account out as a Christian university and their biology department teaches Darwinian evolution as fact. So Nova thought, wow, this is newsworthy. Let's make a special on it. And they did. I watched it three times. I don't know if it's still available on their website. They've taken some of these things off, but it was there. They talk all about it. And to this day, if you study the Christian schools and stuff, universities, you will find that Wheaton is one of the leaders in doing this. They're not the only one. Taylor University, where my wife went, they teach this. Olivet, Nazarene, where I did my undergraduate, that's where I turned from a creationist into a, into a Darwinian evolutionist. But there are some schools that have refused to do that. 
Grand Canyon University, which is becoming very popular, is one that, no, we're going to teach what the Bible says. And I have a lot of friends that are going there and stuff. But no, oh, the Bible has to be wrong. So what are we left with? Well, then it's got to be a fairy tale. So the first 11 chapters are fairy tales. Noah's Ark is a fairy tale. Tower of Babel is a fairy tale. That's what they go to. Several Christians even propose that God, for God to create an aged cosmos, he would be a God of deceit. I've heard this argument. If God really did it in six 24-hour days, because we know it took a long period of time, God's trying to deceive us. It says in the book of Hebrews, Jesus never uttered, and he is God, did not utter deceit. That's against God's character. That can't be right. There's right and wrong answers here. There's no maybes in between. So what did God mean when he commanded Moses to write down in the book of Genesis, because he commands him to do this, what did he mean when he's saying, write this down? Was God trying to deceive the world? Well, it took me 10 million years to do this, but Moses, just tell him it took me six days. Does that sound like God? Of course not. But that's what is being taught very commonly now. What's an allegory? First of all, since I'm using this term, I should explain it. An allegory as many people now believe and many Christians believe that the, uh, Genesis is an allegory. An allegory is taking a story and having it mean something. Instead of being a historical event, it's, it's meaning something else. A classic example, maybe you've seen the movie A Bug's Tale or A Bug's Life. I just pulled this one out because it's a great allegory. It's very famous because it's a movie about a colony of ants um, and is said to be an allegory actually portraying American society. So even though it's talking about ants and stuff, it's actually about society. One of my favorite books I ever read, Watership Down, I think his name was Adams, is an allegory. It talks about rabbits and how they get along and stuff. It's an allegory of human population and human society and, um, and sociology is what it is. It's a great little story if you love rabbits and stuff like that. The movie is terrible, uh, but the book is, is awesome. And... Um, I, it was one of the few books I've ever in my life picked up, started reading on page one, and didn't put it down at all until I finished the book. Read it all through the night until I finished the thing. I was just fascinated by it. So um, these are allegories. An allegory is not an actual historical event. It's a story that is told, and you do like uh, the moral of the story is type thing. Our, a lot of our fractured fairy tales. You guys remember fractured fairy tales on television? It was an old cartoon series that was on back in the 60s. And I'll skip that because no one knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, anyway, so is there any compromise to the gospel? If one places God in a box, if we put God in the box, binding him in his creation, that God can only work through natural processes, because that's what they're saying. God did it all through natural processes. He had to do it that way. We just locked God away in a box. He can't go outside of that, which, again, they're dismissing everything that Jesus and God did. God does not work in the realm of scientific principles. He is not bound by it. He created the laws of science. There was a time the laws of science didn't exist when the creation of the world was taking place. God was moving and making things out of nothing. That's against the laws of science, but it happened. Are there any clues? that God gives us himself, gives the correct way he created the universe? Or is this a debate that is just bound to go on now to the end of time? Can we, in other words, know the answer? I believe we can. So let's take a look at what we have here. Why do people insist that the days of creation are not literal days but errors of millions of years? There's a good question right there. These are questions, by the way, that I've just picked up throughout time, people asking me, and I'm giving you the answers to. So this is a compilation of years of not just research, and also in my own life, when I switched from being a Darwinian evolutionist to a creationist, that I had to resolve. Um, according to Darwin's evolution, single-celled organisms underwent spontaneous generation, as we talked about last night, uh, non-living chemicals, some to living thing about three billion years ago. Around one billion years ago, the first multicellular life forms emerged and things went on with Darwin's tree, as we mentioned. That's Darwinian evolution, as we've talked about. Around 500 million years ago, the first fish evolved, uh, followed by dinosaurs about 230 to about 65 million years ago, who then became extinct. The age of the mammals erupted because the uh, reptiles were gone. Whatever killed them, we don't know. Um, <coughs> 
I believe that they were, many of them were on the ark, and they're probably quite tasty afterwards. But um, man didn't appear until about three million years ago. Uh, and that's what they teach. That's what's taught. And as I've talked about before, and this is so important to understand this, this is the main thing here. Death is important in evolution. <clears throat> Death runs evolution. If we wanted to th put a third pillar to this temple of Darwinian evolution, death is the pillar. You remove death, the whole pillar, the whole theory falls apart too. You have to have death because you've got to eliminate weak genes, genes that don't uh, work as well. We want to get them out of the gene pool. So death is an important part of this. So we have to have death in this. Let me give you the, a statement from Carl Sagan, the late Carl Sagan, a uh, very famous atheist who uh, wrote much about this. He wrote a very best-selling book called The Cosmos. They made it into a TV series. <coughs> he wrote, quote, the secrets of evolution are death and time. The deaths of enormous numbers of life forms that were imperfectly adapted for the environment. And, at, and time for a long succession of small mutations that were by accident adaptive. Time for the slow accumulation of patterns of favorable mutations, unquote. That is Darwinian evolution in a nutshell by one of the greatest Darwinian evolutionists that ever lived. That's what it is. Now, notice how death is so important to this. As we study, death has to run evolution. Death plays a key role in this. You can't have Darwinian evolution without death. Death is normal, thus death is good. It provides opportunities for change. Might, people might say that death actually produced man. I've heard biologists refer to it that way. That we are at the end of the evolutionary chain at this point, and what got us here? Death. Death formed us. Because we changed from other different life forms that we were in our ancestry, um, arthropods, worms, um, all sorts of creatures like that, to what we are today because of death running the process and eliminating certain, certain genes from the gene pool. Well, this would easily explain the day's problem for Genesis if Darwinian evolution was true. It does, you can have some sense out of this if you're going to throw the Bible away. This, this makes sense, and that's why there's so many evolutionists today. They believe this because to them, this makes perfect sense. And you can see their logic, but it totally goes against what God says. Man's solution to it. Making the days as an allegory, then, seems as a way of fixing it. After all, the Hebrew word used for day in Genesis and throughout the, the Old Testament is the day of the word yom. Yom, and you would look up yom in a dictionary lexicon of he ancient Hebrew, it will tell you it can mean a span of time. It can. Yom can be used as a span of time. Now, let's get into this and explain this. Let's examine eight facts that most time are never taught in a church about the Hebrew language and about this word yom. Let's understand how yom is used in scripture. As I said, it can indicate a period of time. It doesn't say millions of years, but it can be a period of time. It is, uh, in ancient Hebrew, it could be referred to, and it is in, in literature, sometimes in ancient Hebrew, referred to it that way. But that's not always true. Let me give you a fact here. First of all, number one, the typical concordance will illustrate that yom can have a range of meanings. It can be a period of light as contrasted to night, thus a 24-hour day. Um, a point in time of a year, it can be referred to also, but it talks, that, that's one way yom is used. It can be like the period between light and day. Um, or light and night. That's, that's one way. Second, a classic, well-respected Hebrew-English lexicon, dictionary, if you will, has seven headings and many subheadings for the meaning of yom. There's a lot of meanings for yom, but it defines the creation days. When you look, look at yom in Genesis chapter 1, and it's defining it, it's talking about days as under this heading, as days defined by an evening and a morning. If you recall, and if you want to look, look at Genesis 1, it will often say the evening and the morning, the evening and the morning. 
you know, the evening and the morning was the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. And there was evening and morning was the third day. Each time it keeps giving us the statement evening and morning with the word yam. It's combined. This is important in ancient Hebrew language. Third, the number and phrase with evening and morning are used in Genesis 1. It says evening and morning, first day, one day. Evening and morning, second day. Evening and morning, third day. Evening and morning, fourth day. Evening and morning, fifth day. Evening and morning, sixth day. Notice each time it's giving us a number. Not only did it give us a time frame of evening and morning, but it's also giving us a time, a number sequence attached to it. This is important in Hebrew. I know most of you don't understand probably ancient Hebrew. None of us in here are experts in Hebrew, including myself. But I'm just telling you what, how the Hebrew language works with the word yam. When it's attached with a time period of a day and a night and a day, or when it is used with a number sequence, when you put yam with either one of those two categories, it means a 24-hour day. Number four, outside of Genesis 1, Yom is used. Now, there's where the problem is. They always just go back to Genesis 1. Yom is used 359 times in the Old Testament. And each time it is used, it means an ordinary 24-hour day. Throughout Scripture, that's how it is used in the Old Covenant. Why then... If that is how it is used from Genesis to Malachi, why then are we saying Genesis 1 has to be different? It doesn't make logical sense. Fifth, outside of Genesis 1, Yom is used with the word evening or morning 23 times. Evening and morning appear in association, but without Yom, 38 times. Now you add those up, you come to 61. All 61 times, it is being referred to as a 24-hour date. If you use day and night or a number, it's a 24-hour day. Now, why are we going to say, if that's how the Hebrew language is set up, why are we saying Genesis 1 is different? Number six, in Genesis 1-5, for instance, yam occurs in the context with the word night. Outside of Genesis 1, Look, at any time the word night appears and is used with, with yam, you're going to find it 53 times. Each individual time, because yam is now being used with the word night, each one of these times it means an ordinary 24-hour day. Why would Genesis 1 be an exception? And if the word is light being associated with day, always is referring to a 24-hour day. You see, if I've lost you here, what I'm talking about is people will say that yam can mean a long period of time. It's true. But when you use yam in association with light, night, day, uh, night, and, night and evening or something like that, or with a number, it's always a 24-hour day. It's not meaning a period of long period of time. Not when you use it in those sequences. And Genesis 1 is using it in those sequences. The plural of yam, which does not appear in Genesis 1, can be used to communicate a longer period of time. That's where they get this. They'll say, well, wait a minute. I know that I've heard that yam can refer to a longer period of time. Yes, when you have it in the plural, but that is not how it is referred to in Genesis. That's where you come across in those days, in the days of David, in the days of Hezekiah. That's not talking in a 24-hour day. It's talking about their lifespan, which is still not millions of years. But clearly... They're, they're associating a name with this or something at those times. Uh, the number here is nonsensical. Now, in Exodus 20, verse 11, where the number is used with days, it's ambiguously refers to a six 24-hour rotation. As I showed you last night, when God was giving us the creation account in the book of Exodus, and he's telling the Israelite nation, why do we have a week? What's going to be a week for you? He's not. He's giving... The word yam here, he's talking about it again with numbers, meaning that these are 24-hour days. Otherwise, if he says, as in those days uh, I created, that could mean like long periods of time. We would have a very interesting week. Our week would be years long. No one wants to work that long. See, we just, we focus so much on Genesis and we miss the rest of it. Eight, this is, the, this is a key one. There are words in biblical Hebrew such as olam, kedem. 
that are suitable for communicating long periods of time, long errors of indefinite time. There are Hebrew words specifically for that. Why aren't they used in Genesis 1? If, if God is saying, trying to tell us that it took millions of years to do that, he would not use yom, he'd be using one of these two words. And he doesn't. He tells Moses specifically, you write this down, and Moses is writing this down. None of these words appear in Genesis chapter 1. You will see none of these words ever appear in the creation account. No matter what book you go to, you will not find those words associated with it. Every time you're going to talk about the days of creation in the biblical account, you're going to see the word yom associated with light and day or a number. And in every single instance, those always, 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 100% of the time is going to be a 24-hour day. When was the last time you hear this taught? Let's look at some experts on this. One expert, Dr. James Barr, professor, Hebrew, Oxford University, sort of a prestigious place. Now, he does not believe in the Genesis account as, as historical. He doesn't. But he does say something fascinating in his studies. He wrote, so as far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer or writers, of Genesis 1 through 11, intended to convey to their readers the ideas that, A, creation took place in a series of six days, which were as the same days as 24-hour days we now experience. B, the figures contained in Genesis genealogies provide simple addition of chronology from the beginning of the world up to the late, later stages in the biblical story. And C, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and extinguished all human and animal life except for those on the ark. Now, this is a guy who's not a believer, and he is saying that every Hebrew scholar at a classic university does believe by just studying the Scripture, this is what the Scriptures mean, that these are short periods of time. How about this one? Marcus Dodds, a professor, New College, Edinburgh, 19th century. He wrote this. For if, for example, the word day in these chapters, does not mean a period of 24 hours, the interpretation of Scripture is hopeless. I mean, these are people that are catching this. It's so sad that the rest of the world doesn't catch these kind of things. But that's what's going on. And like I said before, if one uses this passage to claim that the word yam, day in the Bible, means a thousand years, what does that do to the story of Jonah, who's in the fish for three days? What does that do to Christ being in the earth for three days? Christ is supposed to be in the earth for 3,000 years. That means he hasn't risen yet. And I don't think that's right. Matter of fact, I know it's not right because I have stood in his tomb, and he's not there. You go to the tomb of Muhammad, guess what? He's in there. You go to the tomb of um, one of these other, Krishna and Moon or whatever, you go to these people's tombs, the, go to the tomb of Buddha, guess what? They're in there. You go to the tomb of Jesus Christ, I can verify I've been in there. He's not in there because he's alive. 24-hour days. Is there any interbiblical evidence to support this, Michael? Is there any way from the Bible we can find out if this is true, if Genesis 1 and chapters 1 and 2 are historical? Is there anything? Well, there must be or I wouldn't have put these slides in, right? As I said, the creation account is not just found in Genesis. Chapter 20 of Exodus, verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your sons, your daughters, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, your sojourner who is within your gates. Why? Why, God? Why are we doing it that way? For he says in verse 11, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea, and then it's all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. This is the Genesis account. Therefore the Lord called it the Sabbath, make it holy. Right here, you're seeing God, and, and no one ever argues this. I have never once had a pastor or some other Christian come up and say that this passage is talking about millions of years. They always attack Genesis, yet you see it in Exodus also. God is telling the Israelites that he made the cosmos in six days in Exodus chapter 20. He says it, plain as can be. The wording here is not, 
it's, it's, it's literal. It's not allegorical. He's not making up some fairy tale. Let me tell you the moral of the story now. He doesn't mention that. He's telling him, historically, this is what happened, so I'm setting up your week based upon what I did. It's a historical fact. If God created everything in six million years, followed by the rest uh, of one million years, we would, very, we would have a very interesting long week. Let's go to another passage. Exodus 31, verses 15 through 17. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath, a solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout the generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in, here we go, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Right here again, you got the whole Genesis story wrapped up in a sentence. It's not allegory. How about Matthew? Let's go to the New Testament. The Pharisees came up to him, to Jesus, to test him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them, doesn't say evolved, created them from the beginning made them male and female. Here again, we got the, the gender whole thing here. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, that should become one flesh. So there are no longer two, but one flesh. Wherefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. But this is talking about the creation account again. No one ever comes up to me and say, well, this is talking about millions of years. Or this is talking about some animal had the form. God started this, this animal chain and we have to wait millions of years. He's not saying anything like that. He's saying he created man and woman. He did it. Instantaneously, he did it. There's no, he doesn't say, I created an animal, stood by, and waited a period of so many million yams until it finally became male and female. Where in the world that came from? That's a question biologists can't answer. Where in the world in Darwin's tree does sexual uh, reproduction actually occur? How did that happen? That we end up with different sets of uh, like X and even X and Y chromosomes. How do we get male and female? You know, there's no solution for that in Darwinian evolution. How do you go from one cell and all of a sudden now you have two genders of it? Can't explain it. That was one of those things when I used to debate on that side. I used to hope no one ever asked me because I don't have an answer for it. And they never did. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because of sin. How did this take place? It took place on one day. It talks about in Genesis. But this is specifically saying why death came into God's creation. God didn't create death. It just, it happened. Not his choice. It was man's decision, man's choice, and we brought it in. God's, when he's creating, everything is perfect. After this, things are no longer perfect. That's how sin entered. That's why death happens, because we disobeyed God. And you get to Romans 8. For the creation awaits its eager longing for the revelation or the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Because of mankind, we messed it up. And hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. As I said last night, death was not part of God's creation. In his creation, there is no death. There is no Darwinian evolution. There is no death. Death is not perfect. It's not associated with God. God does not create death. Death is what happens as a result of not being with God. And so death is not part of his thing. God didn't create death and say, wow, that's perfect. Oh, that's perfect. He didn't do that. Death came about by sin. Sin caused death. And it caused it on not just us. The whole of creation is suffering, according to Romans 8. And a day of redemption is coming. And for us, if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we accept that Jesus came, took our place in death so that we don't have to die that spiritual death. He removed our sin. He died and took it from us. Now, if we have Darwinian evolution or theistic evolution, that death is a natural process and that it's a good thing by God, why did Christ have to come and die? It doesn't make sense. There's no reason, if, if it was something that God created and it was a good thing, 
Why did Christ have to come? This totally messes up our entire idea of redemption. 1 Corinthians 5.22, for as by man came death. Right here it says, where did death come from? It's not part of the process of creation. It's something that, was, that came later. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall be all made alive. And so Christ came to conquer death. He came to fix the death. He came to die in our stead. If it was a natural process, there's no reason for him to do that. Does believing in the days of creation make a difference then in theology or atonement in those doctrines? Oh my gosh, yes. One of the basic truths of the Bible is that death is the result of sin. You see it from the beginning of Genesis to you see it in Paul's writings. It goes all the way to Revelation. All through the Bible, you see this. Death is is the result of sin. The Bible insists it is the enemy of God. God didn't create it. But according to theistic evolution, he had to. But they don't catch this. It's never brought out. In their infant minds of theology, people just don't grab this. They just accept the science answer and what people say without actually critically thinking it through and reading the text of the Bible carefully. Death has been pronounced upon all living creatures as a result of Adam's sin. It's there in Scripture. That's what the Bible is showing us. First, the first two chapters of Genesis, God creates a perfect world, a paradise. There is no death. There is no suffering. There is no illness. There's no mutations. There's nothing like this. Then, chapter 3, sin enters the picture. Death enters the picture. Decay, turmoil, just, um Famine, everything, disease, mutations, everything's now happening. People dying, people killing, murder, all these terrible things. This goes on all the way through till you get to the book of Revelation. And then what happens in the last two chapters of Revelation? We're back in paradise. So Genesis 1 and 2 matches with the paradise that comes at the end of the book. Of course, the devil did it in the middle. But as we go through this process, Genesis 3, with the first sin, God says, okay, death it's not my plan, but I'm going to fix it. And they start this sacrificial, sacrificial system and stuff. And Christ has to come as our sacrifice. As a result, the entire creation, the entire cosmos, as I explained last night, some people will say, well, Paul is just writing about the, that sin entered the human race. No, the Greek word is cosmos, the entire creation. What was it like when God created it? As I said, he said every, he created it, and it says in Genesis 1.31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In other words, it's perfect. The same word can be used for perfect. And there was evening, and there was morning, sixth day. Do you see? They got both combinations showing that this yom is a 24-hour period. In ancient Hebrew, that's what that's saying. Genesis 1.29-30, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the field and to every bird of the heavens and everything that creepeth on the earth, everything that has had breath on life, of life, uh, I have given every green plant for food. And so it was so God created an aged earth. It didn't have to evolve. He created everything together. As we were making a joke earlier, I can't remember who it was. When God created Adam and Eve, they weren't infants. God didn't create Adam and Eve as infants. And then, oh boy, I better create pampers. Then he created Pampers, and as I was joking around, but Pampers sometimes leak. Ooh, i got to make another one. i got to fix this. Uh, let's invent, or I'll create Huggies. No, this is ridiculous. But in a way, that's what some people are saying. These two verses alone r- raise an interesting problem for Christians who believe that God used evolution as a means to create the cosmos. Right here, God tells us that predator-prey relationships did not exist in his creation. That's what drives Darwinian evolution. Death is an enemy of God, not part of his creation. Though I have argued this with some Christians, and they just can't accept it because they are so brainwashed into believing what's in a biology textbook is truth. God did not create death, and he makes, every, uh, makes it very, very clear that death is a punishment for sin. Thus, death must come into existence Um, after the sin of Adam. There was no death until Adam sinned. And they just can't catch that. 
God created man to live forever. In the creation account, we were supposed to live forever in fellowship with God. You want to know your purpose in life? Your purpose in life isn't what kind of car you're going to drive, who you're going to marry, what's your career, where you're going to live. Your purpose in life is to fill what God created you for, to be in a personal, close relationship with him, to walk in the gardens and stuff with him. That's why you exist, to praise and worship him. That's our purpose in life. And until you figure that out, you're never going to be happy. That's your purpose in life. Students used to ask me in the public school. I remember one time in particular, student asked me, one of the first days of class, Michael, can you tell me what the purpose of life is? He was making a joke. Yeah, Michael, can you tell us what the purpose of life is? Oh, certainly, that's easy. Huh? And I told him the answer I just gave you. He's like, oh. I said, that's it. It's that, that simple. Now, according to your biology book, I said it's going to be different. You've got to kill certain organisms to help evolution run, and you have to eventually be killed yourself. There's your Darwinian evolution solution to your purpose in life. But look what it says here. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, death through sin, so death spread to all men because of sin. See, this is not God's creation. This isn't, wasn't, was not his design. This death described by Paul is not only spiritual death, but it's physical death. It's talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 22. For by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, also, so also in Christ uh, shall all be made alive. So we have death and Christ coming to conquer death. Why did Christ come? To conquer death. Where did death come from? It wasn't God's process. It was something man started and God had to fix it. And it was all set up in Genesis 3. The first sin, God even prophesied I was going to do it. He says, unto you, uh, there will, shall be a woman who will be born and her offspring will crush the iniquity. He will be bruised in the process. Genesis 3.15. If Adam's sin did not bring physical death, theologically then and doctrinally, Christ's resurrection from physical death does not bring eternal life. People often don't think of that one. They are tied together. The, scripture, the whole Bible is showing that. The first death occurred, something had to die. An animal died. Adam and Eve should have, but God showed mercy, killed an animal, an innocent animal. And he set up this to cover their sin. Genesis 3.21, the Lord made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, clothed them. Where did that skin come from? Somebody had to die to cover sin. There's your first death. Which then set in motion the concept for the, the wages of sin is death. We all know that verse from Romans. He also stated that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That's Leviticus 17. It's repeated again, basically, in, Rome, uh, in Hebrews 9.22. Death is not God's plan. Christ had to come to conquer death. This leaves us with a serious situation in respect to our worldviews then. If evolution or even just the concept of an old earth being billions of years old is correct, then death is a natural process. Death is normal. Death produces man. Death is good. Why are we so upset with death? It's a good process. It helps the gene pools to be purified. In this view, death is not, get this, death is is not the penalty for sin. What did we just do to theology? We just threw it out the window. If this is true, if the earth is old, death is not the penalty for sin. It's already existing. It's a necessary component. So death is not the penalty for sin because it preceded man in sin. And God's story and the whole concept of the Bible is totally worthless. Why can't people see this? I'm talking Christians here who say that they believe that the Bible is the word of God, that say that they, they understand all this, and they understand atonement, they understand redemption, they understand uh, uh, all these theological terms, and they accept all that. Why can't they catch this? It's because they're trying to put too much faith in this kind of stuff. They're using this more, I hate to say it, but they are. They're putting more faith in this than they're putting in here. If death is not the penalty for sin, then the death of Christ did not pay the penalty or his resurrection provide our release. 
we're still stuck in the same place where we're at. There is no eternal life for us. If the earth is old, there's your problem. Now, please, I said this last night, and I'm going to utter it again. I'm not saying anybody who believes in an old earth is not a Christian. I'm not. I believe there's baby Christians. And I think it's a baby Christian who swallows this. As a Christian matures, I was a baby Christian. I believed in this. I was a Christian. I was a theistic evolutionist. All of a sudden, things started showing up in my science uh, work and stuff like that. This isn't working. And when I started studying then doctrine, as I started studying the Bible on this and started studying Hebrew, I started saying, oh, my gosh, by having an old earth, I just threw out the entire atonement process. Redemption just went out the window if I accept this because death is not the enemy of God. If evolution is right, then Christianity is wrong, flat out. And I'm talking about Darwinian evolution. Animals do change and stuff, but that's different. It would, they, there's still going to be dogs. There's still going to be, I know that Noah on the ark did not have Morgan breed horses because Morgan breed of horses didn't develop until the 1700s. But he did bring on the ark some type of horse-like animal, a kind of horse that carried the genetics that then, as they came off the ark, was able to breed out. And we do this all the time with dogs. Do not we have, there was some type of dog, probably a wolf, that was on the ark because, I say wolf because there have been arc, uh, studies done at major universities studying the different breed. Are you ready for this one? This is our government tax money at work. Uh, some grad students got permission to study for um, their thesis, um, are all dogs related? And so they went out and they studied all breeds of dogs and they took DNA samples from them. And then they went back and they started tracing it back and they found out that if you take a common like timber wolf, you can make every breed of dog. Why? They're all the same kind. And what does it say in Genesis when God is talking about putting animals on the ark? You, make, you take this kind, this kind, this kind. If evolution is right, Christianity is wrong. It would have to be because this destroys the foundation of the gospel. Why did Jesus even have to go to the cross? If death is a good process, if death is necessary. Even atheists catch this. Christians don't. Atheists even understand this. This is out of the American Atheist Journal, September 20th, 1979. Look what Richard Bozarth, very famous atheist, what he, he wrote in an article called The Meaning of Evolution. He says, quote, Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution. For evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, and in the rubble you will find the sorrow remains of the Son of God. If Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing, unquote. This guy gets it the mo better than most Christians. He nails it right. If you believe in an old earth that death is necessary, you've just destroyed the whole process, really, of what Jesus came to do. You can still be a Christian. You just don't understand what is all taking place. That's really sorry. We have too many baby Christians around. In short, if death is not the penalty for sin, then Christianity is meaningless. If Christianity, or in Christianity, the death of Jesus Christ was made necessary, why? Because of man's sin. Man's sin brought about death. Believing in the days of being millions of years long places God back into this terrible box, limiting his power, totally destroying the doctrine of redemption and atonement. It's, it's gone. It degrades the entire Bible, especially the gospel. The Bible soundly reveals not only the origin of death, but how this death will be resolved. Like I say, you get to the end of the book, we have a great story. Revelation 21.4, he will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death, notice this, death shall be no more. It's not part of God's plan. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain or any more for the former things have passed away. Notice that death is considered part of that. It's not God's creation. So there's your answer. How do I talk to someone who doesn't, who believes, who claims to be a Christian and is a Christian, but claims that the earth is billions of years old, that maybe God used evolution, but the earth is millions of years old? We just, 
saw all the problems that happened doctrinally. Let's take a break and we're going to come back and I'll show you some more on this. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that content, you can find more like it on our channel and on our website. You can also book us and get the live experience, which in my opinion is even better, but who knows, I'm a little biased. You can also help us keep this content free by liking, sharing, and subscribing to our channel or our other social links. You can also help support this ministry by donating online through our website or in the link down in the description. And on that note, may the Lord be with you and we'll see you on the next video.